Thank you for joining us um, for the first of uh, today's workshops, Deadly Connections, Challenging Nuclear Weapons, Nuclear Power, and Climate Change. I am Sophia Wollman from the American Friends Service Committee. Thank you for the reminder. Um, and during this morning's workshop, um, we're going to be, like the uh, title suggests, uh, exploring the connections between nuclear weapons, nuclear po power, and climate change. As these are um, two of the existential um, threats facing humanity and our planet. They are human um, <coughs> created, but uh, with human ingenuity and commitment, um, they can be also overcome um, by humans and, and more uh, precisely probably by the power of the people. Um, so we'll be exploring the direct ecological impacts and threats of uh, nuclear technology and climate change, as well as the systemic and systematic connections, the economic um, importance of these issues, the political role um, that they play uh, in military tensions, um, as well as the uh, economic systems that uh, benefit uh, directly um, from, from these destructive forces that so threaten um, humanity and our ways of life. So beginning with uh, Jackie Cabasso. Um, Jackie has been executive director for the Western, of the uh, Western States Legal Foundation since 1984. She's been involved in nuclear disarmament, peace, and environmental uh, advocacy at the local, national, and international levels for over 30 years and is a leading uh, advocate and voice for nuclear abolition. She was a founding mother of Abolition 2000, um, the, the global network to eliminate nuclear weapons uh, back in 1995. And since 2007, she has served as the North American Coordinator for, of Mayors for Peace. Um, she also serves as national co-convener uh, for the United for Peace and Justice and convenes its nuclear disarmament and redefining security working groups. She's a co-author of Nuclear Disorder um, or Cooperative Security, U.S. Weapons of Terror, the Global Pro Proliferation Crisis and Paths to Peace, um, and the co-author of Risking Peace, Why We Sat in the Road. Um, which is an account of the huge 1983 nonviolent protest at the Livermore <coughs> Nuclear Weapons Lab and the subsequent mass trial conducted by Western States Legal Foundation. Um, she has been arrested uh, more than 50 times for active non acts of nonviolent direct action, um, which shows her incredible commitment to these causes. And she received the IPB's 2008 Sean McBride uh, Peace Award and the Agape Foundation's 2009 Endurance <coughs> Visionary Prize. So welcome to all of you. Thank you all so much for being here for your work, and let's begin. Thank you, Sophia, and thanks to everyone for coming. You had a lot of choices to make in this very uh, packed kind of convergence, and we're very pleased that you decided to join us. So I'll get right to it. I'm going to sort of do the Nukes 101, just to lay some groundwork for the speakers who are going to follow. In January of this year, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and, and uh, Science and Security Board wrote to UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and the members of the UN Security Council warning that its doomsday clock now stands at five minutes to midnight, <coughs> primarily due to the twin existential threats posed by nuclear weapons and climate change. Both stem from the same roots. If you care about nuclear weapons, you should care about climate change. And conversely, if you care about climate change, you should care about nuclear weapons. <coughs> With conflicts raging around the world and the post-World War II order crumbling, we are now standing on the precipice of a new era of great power wars. The potential for wars among nations possessing nuclear weapons are growing. And some nations are starting to make the role of nuclear weapons more central in their national security policies. When the Cold War ended, Everybody around the planet, I think, breathed a collective sigh of relief, feeling that they had escaped the possibility of global thermonuclear war and forgetting about nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, the nuclear weapons establishments in the most powerful states quickly regrouped, came up with new justifications for maintaining nuclear weapons, and the enterprise continued. Today, two and a half decades later, an estimated 16,300 nuclear weapons, most held by the U.S. and Russia, pose an intolerable threat to humanity due to the ever-present pres potential for use, whether intentional, accidental, or due to miscalculations. The International Committee of the Red Cross has warned that incalculable human suffering would result from any use of nuclear weapons and that there could be no adequate humanitarian response. 
Despite the 45-year-old commitment enshrined in Article 6 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation <coughs> Treaty, there are no nuclear disarmament negotiations on the horizon. While over the past three years there has been a marked uptick in nuclear disarmament initiatives by governments not possessing nuclear weapons, both within and outside the United Nations, the U.S. has been notably missing in action at best and dismissive or obstructive at worst. Nuclear armed countries are spending over $100 billion a year on nuclear weapons and related costs. These expenditures are expected to grow as nuclear weapon states undertake ambitious programs to modernize their warheads and delivery systems. As currently planned, maintaining and modernizing the U.S. nuclear arsenal and the infrastructures to support it will exceed $1 trillion over the next 30 years. Put another way, every hour the U.S. spends almost $2 million on nuclear weapons, and by 2030 it will be spending nearly $4 million an hour on nuclear weapons and missiles. The U.S. government is officially committed to modernizing its nuclear bombs and warheads, the submarines, missiles, and aircraft that carry them, and the laboratories and plants that design, maintain, and manufacture nuclear weapons. U.S. policy and budget documents all manifest an intent to keep thousands of nuclear weapons in active service for the foreseeable future, together with the capacity to bring stored weapons into service and to design and manufacture new weapons should they be desired. Russia's nuclear weapons programs and policies closely mirror those of the U.S. and are also reflected in the, in the other nuclear weapons possessing states. The Cold War and post-Cold War approach to disarmament was quantitative, based mainly on bringing down the insanely huge Cold War stockpile numbers, presumably en route to zero. Now disarmament has been turned on its head. By pruning away the grotesque Cold War excesses, nuclear disarmament has, for all practical purposes, come to mean fewer but newer nuclear weapons, with an emphasis on huge long-term investments in nuclear weapons infrastructures and qualitative improvements in the weapons themselves projected for decades to come. Nuclear weapons do not exist in isolation. Newly elected anti-war candidate Barack Obama, if you remember that candidate, on the eve of his swearing in as President of the United States declared, Going forward, we'll continue to make the investments necessary to strengthen our military and increase our ground forces to defeat the threats of the 21st century. Hundreds of thousands of active duty troops and U.S. military personnel are deployed in approximately 150 countries around the world. In 2012, the U.S. spent as much on its military as the next 11 countries combined, $682 billion, more than two and a half times more than China and Russia combined. The U.S. military dominates the globe through its operation of 10 unified combatant commands, overseeing a network of more than 1,000 foreign bases in at least 130 countries. Global operations are coordinated by United States Strategic Command, or STRATCOM, headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska, which is in charge of U.S. nuclear war planning. Nuclear weapons, still at the core of STRATCOM's mission, exist within this system of military, extended military bases and unified combatant commands. Nuclear weapons remain central to the national security policy of the nuclear armed states and their allies who shelter under the nuclear umbrella. As calculated by Randy Rydell, senior political officer of the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs, over half the world's population lives in countries whose national security policies explicitly depend on nuclear weapons and the doctrine of deterrence, that is, the threatened use of nuclear weapons. So looking at the current conflict between the U.S. slash NATO and Russia over the Ukraine, let's take a look at what NATO policy is. According to the 2010 NATO strategic concept, deterrence based on an appropriate mix of nuclear and conventional capabilities remains a core element of our overall strategy. As long as nuclear weapons exist, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. The supreme guarantee of the security of the Allies is provided by the strategic nuclear forces of the Alliance, particularly those of the United States, the independent strategic nuclear forces of the United Kingdom and France, which have a deterrent role of their own, contribute to the overall deterrence and security of the Allies. On August 29th, Vladimir Putin said, Moscow doesn't want or intend to wade into any large-scale conflicts. 
But a few breaths later, he said, Russia is strengthening our nuclear deterrence forces and our armed forces, making them more efficient and modernized. I want to remind you that Russia is one of the most powerful nuclear nations. This is a reality, not just words. The final declaration of the recently concluded NATO summit in Wales supports modernization of US nuclear forces based in Europe. And this spring, at the height of tensions over the Ukraine, both the US and Russia conducted nuclear exercises. 69 years ago, the United States unleashed the nuclear age, dropping a single atomic bomb on Hiroshima, which indiscriminately incinerated tens of thousands of children, women, and men in an instant, a tiny and crude nuclear weapon by today's standards, justified by a lie of historic proportions that the bombing ended World War II and saved American lives. Over 90% of the doctors and nurses in Hiroshima were killed or injured by the bomb. Let's, let's talk about what the effects of that bomb were. This is a quote from the mayor of Hiroshima, Takashi Hiraoka, before the International Court of Justice in 1995. The atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki shattered all war precedent. The mind-numbing damage of these nuclear weapons shook the foundations of human existence. Beneath the atomic bomb's monstrous mushroom cloud, human skin was burned raw. Crying for water, human beings died in desperate agony. With thoughts of these victims as a starting point, it is incumbent upon us to think about the nuclear age and the relationship between human beings and nuclear weapons. The unique characteristics of the atomic bombing was that the enormous destruction was instantaneous and universal. Old, young, male, female, soldier, civilian. The killing was utterly indiscriminate. The entire city was exposed to the compound and devastating effects of thermal rays, shock, wave blast, and radiation. Above all, we must focus on the fact that the human misery caused by the atomic bomb is different from that caused by conventional weapons. Human bodies were burned by the thermal rays and high temperature fires, broken and lacerated by the blasts, and insidiously attacked by radiation. These forms of damage compounded and amplified each other. The bomb reduced Hiroshima to an inhuman state, utterly beyond human ability to express or imagine. How much do have time? Great. So, as described by Eric Schlosser, whose recent book, Command and Control, Nuclear Weapons, The Damascus Accident and the Illusion of Safety, documents a remarkable number of serious fires, explosions, false attack alerts, and accidentally dropped bombs that have occurred in the US. And he wrote, or he said in an interview, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima was an incredibly crude and inefficient weapon. When it exploded, about 99% of the uranium that was supposed to undergo this chain reaction didn't. It just blew apart in the air. And a very small percentage, maybe 2% of the fissile material, actually detonated. And most of it became just other radioactive elements. This major city, Hiroshima, was destroyed in an instant, and 80,000 people were killed, and two-thirds of the buildings in this enormous metropolitan area were destroyed instantly, because seven-tenths of a gram of uranium-235 became pure energy. To imagine how small an amount that is, seven-tenths of a gram of uranium is about the size of a peppercorn. Seven-tenths of a gram weighs less than a dollar bill. Even though this weapon was unbelievably inefficient and almost 99% of the uranium had nothing to do with the detonation of the destruction of Hiroshima, it was a catastrophic explosion. Nuclear weapons since then have become remarkably efficient and small and capable of destruction that makes Hiroshima seem trivial. Let's look at just what, what one modern nuclear bomb could do. And here I'm citing a study done by our next speaker, M. V. Ramana, in 1999 on the hypothetical bombing of Bombay. And he wrote, based on the available population data, the historical experience of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and different physical models, we have estimated short-term casualties from a hypothetical explosion over Bombay. For a 15 kiloton explosion, and that's about the size of the Hiroshima bomb, the number of deaths would range between 160,000 to 866,000. 
a 150 kiloton weapon, that's a modern weapon, typical. The number of deaths, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a 150 kiloton weapon would cost somewhere between 736,000 and 8,660,000 deaths. In addition, there would be several hundreds of thousands of people who would suffer from injuries or burns. Many of them may die without prompt medical aid, which is quite unlikely. These estimates are conservative, and there are a number of reasons to expect that the actual numbers would be much higher. Further, these estimates do not include the long-term effects like cancers that would afflict thousands of people in the following years of genetic mutations and would affect future generations. All right, I'm going to skip ahead to just some of the deadly connections between nuclear weapons and nuclear power. Nuclear weapons and nuclear power require identical materials and technologies. Their links are technical, environmental, historical, legal, political, and economic. Nuclear weapons and nuclear power share identical technologies and an identical fuel chain, starting with the mining, milling, and enrichment of uranium, fabrication of nuclear fuel, and operation of reactors with deadly byproducts, including long-lived radioactive uh, nuclear waste. Enriched uranium at the front end and reprocessing of spent fuel at the back end can be diverted to nuclear weapons programs. As Fukushima has reminded us yet again, there is nothing good about nuclear power. In addition to the certainty of catastrophic accidents and the resulting massive releases of radiation that do not respect city, state, or national boundaries, there are routine emissions at every step of the nuclear fuel chain, from mining, milling, and enrichment of uranium, to fabrication of nuclear fuel, to daily operation of nuclear power plants, to storage of spent fuel. These releases always endanger public health and safety. Moreover, nuclear power is incredibly expensive and capital intensive and highly centralized. Nuclear power plants take years to build and have limited energy production lifetime before they become too dangerously radioactive to operate. The dangers associated with producing and processing nuclear materials and the extremely sensitive nature of these materials due to their inherently dual use capability necessitate a level of secrecy and security that is fundamentally anti-democratic. Nuclear power benefits that infamous 1% who know that it's such a bad economic gamble that they won't even consider building new plants without federal loan guarantees and the Price-Anderson Act, which caps the utility's liability for an accident at $10.8 billion. It's actually estimated that a serious nuclear accident could cost as much as $600 billion, the balance of which would likely be paid by taxpayers. And there is no way to safely dispose of or sequester from living things in the environment the highly radioactive spent fuel that remains deadly for more than 100,000 years, the same number of years that the human species as we know it is believed has existed. The U.S. has, is believed to have more than 77,000 tons of such high level radioactive waste and the amount increases every day any nuclear power plant operates. Nuclear power is not a solution to global warming. And I believe that Raman will talk more about that. The U.S.-Russia conflict over the Ukraine and the China-Japan conflict over the contested Senkaku Dayu Islands, which, in which the U.S. has pledged to support Japan, indicate that a new era of confrontation between nuclear armed powers has begun. And nuclear tensions in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and on the Korean Peninsula remind us that the potential for nuclear war is ever present. In a time of twin global and economic and environmental crises and growing competition over natural resources, the dangers of even more conflicts among nuclear armed states are increasing. There's good reason to believe that the potential escalation of conflict among nuclear armed states leading to nuclear war is much more likely than the potential use by a state of nuclear weapons, which do not yet exist, or by subnational terrorist groups that do not yet have them. Yet this very real threat is largely dismissed. We can't afford to wait any longer, decades more, for the elimination of nuclear weapons. The Mayor's for Peace 2020 vision is the right vision. In his August 6, 2014 peace declaration, Hiroshima Mayor Kazumi Matsui, President of Mayors for Peace, declared, quote, Each one of us will help determine the future of the human family. 
Please put yourself in the place of the Hibaksha Yebam survivors. Imagine their experiences, including that day from the depths of hell, actually happening to you or someone in your family. To make sure the tragedies of Hiroshima and Nagasaki never happen a third time, let's all communicate, think, and act together with the Hibaksha for a peaceful world without nuclear weapons and without war. We will do our best. Mayors for Peace, now with over 6,200 member cities, will work in conjunction with NGOs and the United Nations to disseminate the facts of the bombings and the message of Hiroshima. We will steadfastly promote the new movement stressing the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons and seeking to outlaw them. We will help to strengthen international public demand for the start of negotiations on a nuclear weapons convention with the goal of total elimination by 2020. And as Rabbi Michael Lerner has said, Martin Luther King did not motivate millions of people by saying, I have a complaint. He had a dream <laughs> and he had a vision. Thank you. Um, moving right along to M.B. Ramana, um, who received his PhD in physics from Boston University and is currently with the Nuclear Futures Laboratory and, and the Program on Science and Global Security at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Um, he has worked on a range of issues related to nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. Ramana is the author of The Power of Promise, Examining Nuclear Energy in India, and co-editor of Prisoners of the Nuclear Dream. He is a member of the International Panel on Fissile, Missile, uh, Fissile Materials, uh, the Science and Security Board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and National Coordinating Committee of India's Coalition for Nuclear Disarmament and Peace, and on the Global Council of Abolition 2000. He is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Leo Seilert Award of the Fi uh, American Physical Society. So welcome, Mr. Ramana. Thank you. And um, it's also a little, um, what should we say, uh, unnerving to have uh, half of your talk being stolen by Jackie. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> there are all lots of stuff which I wanted to say about nuclear power. But that's okay. You know, you know all this stuff, so there's no need to sort of reinforce all that. Um, and it's probably good that it's out of the way. Um, I want to start by sort of coming back to why many of us are in New York this weekend, uh, which is the grave danger of climate change that we all sort of recognize. Um, it's, you know, rightly described as an emergency by some people. We have to do things really fast if we have to have any chance at all of averting disastrous climate change. And so we are told many, quite often that all options should be on the table. And this is a <laughs> statement which comes up very, very often. Um, and because nuclear power is a low carbon source of electricity, and I don't dispute that at all, uh, we can talk about that later if you want, um, it's, we are told that nuclear power should be on the table. And that's certainly true, I agree. The problem is that nuclear power is already well on the table, right? You have dozens of governments supporting nuclear power, building nuclear power plants. You have a um, number of um, uh, 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 construction companies, nuclear construction companies who go around trying to sell nuclear power plants to every country in the world. There's an army of lobbyists who use every possible technique out on the, out on the propaganda book to try and convince us that nuclear power is a good thing, right? and that we should be doing something. Uh, and yet, nuclear power is actually, um, in terms of uh, how much it contributes to the world's electricity, it's actually declining, right? The historically high figure was in the early 90s. It was around 17% of the global electricity. Today it's about 10 to 11%, right? And it's coming down every year. And if in, in any kind of business as usual scenario, by like 2030, it's probably going to be down to a few percent, six percent, seven percent, and more, something of that sort. Um, so it's not something which is, unless something miraculous happens, is not going to really help us uh, with this problem of climate change. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what the nature of the problem is. But uh, b uh, let me just say here that you know some of the issues which I think confront us uh, in terms of thinking about nuclear power as a solution. Uh, are that the countries that are uh, increasing their emissions rapidly, so-called developing countries, are all places where there is not much nuclear power. Uh, I happen to have studied one of them 
for a very long time, which is India. Uh, India has had a nuclear power program for 60 years. Right? And every government has supported it with all its heart. And yet, nuclear power constitutes something like 2 to 4 percent of the country's electricity. Every time there's a new reactor, it'll go up to about 4 percent, then it'll come back down to about 2 percent as other things get built up. And this has been the state for the last 20 years. Right? And if I had to bet, you know, in several years, I mean, several decades from now, it would still be in the same kind of range. Why is that the case? Uh, this is the case partly because of um, uh, the fact that nuclear power is an extremely complex technology. It is not easy to build nuclear reactors. They take a long time to build. They cost a lot. And lots of things can go wrong. And the only way that the um, nuclear enterprise, as uh, Jackie sort of put it uh, earlier, tries to sell you this dream is to say, you know, all the problems we had with nuclear power, don't think about it. Right? <laughs> From now on, it's going to be perfect. All the problems you've done, and you've sort of exhausted the set of problems that are there. And from now on, it's going to be all rosy, right? So in a way, nuclear power has been the sort of archetypal future tense technology, right? You don't look at the past. If you look at the history, you're going to be real, you know, uh, unhappy about it, right? So that's really the sort of uh, way by which it's going to go forward, right? So, you know, that's, I think, the uh, reality of what's going to be happening. Um, the uh, one other thing, one other thing that the industry always sort of talks about is that well, you know, these are problems which happened because these were old reactors, right? And think about Fukushima. They say, oh, that was a generation two reactor, you know, whatever that means. Um, I mean, I've been studying this for you know two decades. I still don't understand what one of these generations mean. But anyway, um, but of course, in terms of new technologies, new nuclear reactor design, all these problems are not going to be there, right? And all the problems that Jackie mentioned, the fact that they are prone to catastrophic accidents, the problem that they are expensive, the problem that they produce radioactive waste that stays hazardous to human health for hundreds of thousands of years, and the problem that they are related to nuclear weapons. These are four problems, you know, safety, uh, cost, uh, waste, and uh, proliferation are things which even the nuclear industry will admit. But what they usually will say is that, oh, we have now a new generation of reactors. Right? And these are going to magically solve. True. If you look at any of those designs, um, these different priorities, shall we say, increasing safety, uh, making it cheaper, reducing the amount of waste produced, uh, trying to uh, reduce the link with proliferation, they all pull in different directions. You cannot make one reactor design that does all of this simultaneously. You want to make something cheaper, you're probably going to make it less safe. You want to make something produce less waste, you're probably going to make it more proliferation, uh, pro uh, proliferation risky. Right? So that is a fundamental problem with this thing. There is no one magical solution that's going to come. Okay. So this, I think, is the, is the main sort of um, uh, problem with nuclear power. But I also want to now get to a different point, which is, um, and I don't want to sort of, this is, as I said, a, a well-known point. We don't want to sort of beat around that which is to come back to the question of um, climate change itself, right? And ask the question, what kind of a problem is climate change? In what sense can this be a solution, right? And if you ask uh, people, what is, the, what is the problem of climate change? In this country especially, the, the answer you typically get is, our carbon dioxide emissions are rising and rising, and the Earth's capacity does not hold, and so we have to reduce that emissions. And you can do that by some combination of technologies, and maybe some set of economic tricks, you know, cap and trade or whatever it is. And that is the problem. And that's how you have to approach the solution. You go to the rest of the world, especially in the so-called developing countries, and you ask them the same question. What's, what's the problem of climate change? And they'll give you a very different answer. They'll say, the Earth's atmosphere <coughs> has only a limited capacity for dealing with greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide emissions. Right? And this space will have to be equitably shared. Right now, there are a bunch of countries which have emitted a huge amount in the past, and as a consequence, they've become very rich. And now that we are sort of becoming a little bit richer, they're all getting concerned about it and telling us we don't get our fair share of this. Right? So it becomes a question of sharing. right? And this is the problem that has been confounding, in a sense, all the climate negotiations that are going on under the UNFCCC. Um, so every year, every, every year, the 
thousands of parties for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change meet in various parts of the world, and they try to say, okay, let's come to some kind of agreement. You know, this was what the Kyoto Protocol was for a decade and a half ago, and the thing that confounds them is basically the problem of sharing. And why is that sort of be being such a big problem? It's been a problem partly because um, those countries which have already sort of cornered a large portion of the Earth's atmosphere, have sort of uh, squatted on those uh, uh, emission rights as it were, um, are unwilling in any way to try and change their ways of life. Right? And the first President Bush said this quite well uh, when he went to the Rio conference. He said, the American way of life is not up for negotiation. Right? <laughs> but lest you think that this is a problem only with Republicans, Barack Obama said almost exactly the same thing um, at his inauguration meeting. He said, we are not, I forget the exact quote, uh, but uh, you can go and look it up, it's not very difficult. It's, he says something along the lines of, we will never waver in our defense of our way of life, right? And so you want to ask the question, what is this way of life, right? That they're sort of so unwavering in their defense. And, um, you, know, you know, in one word, if you want to put it, it's consumerism of some kind, right? And this is sort of fundamental to the economic structure that we have. The economic structure that we have is based fundamentally on ever increasing economic growth, right? The moment you find these GDP growth figures sort of fall below some you know, magical number, around 3% or something, people get very uncomfortable, right? They say, oh my god, something is wrong. We need to do something to boost the economy, lower the interest rate, do something to do that, right? And in this, given that we are in New York, I remind you of what happened on Sept after September 11th, right? The, the uh, horrible strikes on the Twin Towers. And of course, people were shocked. And for a few days, you know, everybody was in shock, people talking to each other, you know, sitting at homes. And then everybody had to come out and say, please go and shop. We have a problem, right? And please go and fly the planes, right? These are sort of the ways which, and you know, this is not something which is inherent to people, right? It's the economy that does it to it. I mean, and uh, again, there's an enterprise of people who are, an army of people who are uh, employed to try and convince people that they need to, con they need to consume more, right? Um, the quintessential, quintessential example is sort of Apple, right? Um, you know, and I must, when I must say that, you know, no, no offense to her, there was a lovely young woman who was sitting next to me on the train who had with her an iPhone, um, two iPads, <laughs> and Mac, all right? And she was sort of doing something, you know, very industriously, sort of transferring stuff from one to the other, checking something on the other. And of course, like a real poster child for Apple, uh, for the Apple company, she actually took out Apple and ate it. For a <laughs> no offense meant to her, okay? Uh, but this is, I think, one of the major problems that we actually um, deal with, right? Uh, and, you know, and likewise, a couple of days ago in the New York Times, there was a piece which talked about how um, many of these companies had gone to developing countries like China and India to try and figure out how we can sell stuff to them, to their, to the you know many billions of people who really have incomes which are appallingly low compared to ours. So we have to make products that they can buy within their thing and to sort of live in that particular kind of infrastructure. Again, these are all people who are engaged in trying to make sure that people consume more and more and more. And so not just is not just the West, it's also the, in these developing countries, the elite in those countries. And the rest of the people, quite naturally, are aspiring to higher and higher standards. And on a finite planet, infinite growth is not possible, right? Uh, the um, uh, Indian leader, Mahatma Gandhi, once put it this way. He said, the earth has enough for every man's need, but not for every man's greed. Um, and uh, so that, I think, is, is the sort of conundrum that we live with. And until we sort of confront that, um, we are not going to be able to deal with uh, climate change. Right? Mm -hmm. And the problem with nuclear power, in a sense, is that it actually reinforces that particular paradigm. Right? And it does so in two ways. One is this sort of notion that this, this is magical technology that's going to come and fix the problem without us having to make any kind of hard choices about how we live our lives, how we organize our society, how our economy is organized, and so on. Right? Uh, my friend Bob Jensen, who teaches in the journalism school in uh, UT Austin, uh, in uh, Texas Austin, he talks about denialism of, of climate change. He says there are two kinds of denial. One is the Republican kind that we all know, right? They deny the science. They kind of somehow, they don't want this to come in their way of what they think the world should be like. And so they say, oh, climate change doesn't exist, right? But there's also what he calls 
left-wing denialism, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the f idea that somehow everything can be done. We just have to do a small few changes, you know, change the bulbs here, you know, put on a few solar photovoltaic panels, and maybe build a few nuclear power plants, and the problem will go away, right? That is sort of denying the real and stupendous change that we have to make in the way we organize society if you were to really confront this problem. Right? And that's sort of not happening. There's a second way in which nuclear power sort of reinforces that, and uh, which is that if you think about empirically, as I mentioned right in the beginning, you know, nuclear power plants don't emit much carbon dioxide, certainly when they, when they operate, right? There's some stuff which happens in the way, but it's relatively small. But uh, if you look at um, a real life empirical example, um, which is the case of Japan, right? Uh, between 1970 and 1995, Japan built a huge number of nuclear power plants, right? Its nuclear capacity went from zero to approximately 40,000 megawatts. During the same period, its carbon emissions tripled from 400,000 to 1,200,000 uh, tons of, a million tons of uh, carbon dioxide. Why did that go up? Right? It went up not because nuclear power plants were sort of emitting, but because the way nuclear power plants make any kind of economic sense is only in a society that is based on consumption of large amounts of energy. You will not invest the billions of dollars it takes to build a nuclear power plant if you are not convinced that people are going to consume all this and more. Right? And if you go to France, for example, which has a huge number of nuclear power plants, their electric company goes around telling people, you should put electric heating in your house. Extremely <laughs> inefficient way, right? But that's the way they're going to be able to sustain their thing, right? And sustain their, their whole enterprise. And so this is the second reason why nuclear power is not going to really get around uh, the problem of climate change. So I will end by just saying one thing, which is that there are two ways people have approached the question of climate change. One, as I said, is that this is a climate emergency and every, every possible option should be on the table. The other way, and that's why a far fewer number of people, is to say climate change represents a, not just a threat to the, you know, the atmosphere and the environment, but to our way of thinking how our society should be organized. And we should be asking a lot of deeper questions about this. And we have to be making far more changes about it. And by sort of adopting technologies of kind of nuclear power, what you're actually doing is to sort of forget all these harder questions and not dealing with them. And I would sort of end by saying a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to Joseph Gerson, disarmament coordinator for the American Friends Service Committee. Um, he focuses on preventing nuclear war and achieving nuclear weapons abolition education and organizing for peaceful and just alternatives um, to U.S.-led uh, militarization in Asia and the Pacific, and also the prevention of U.S. wars, focusing most recently on the Ukraine and Iraq. He has initiated and is currently co-coordinating uh, co U.S. and international NGO planning for the 2015 MP MPT review. Give a little plug, there's a, a flyer over there in the back um, with contact info. Um, and he's co-coordinating that with two of our other presenters, Jackie Cavasso here and Judith LeBlanc, who will be um, on the panel of the next workshop in this room that I encourage you all to attend. Um, he convenes the Working Group for Peace and Demilitarization of Asia, Asia and the Pacific, is a board member of the International Peace Bureau and a steering committee member of the Middle Powers um, Initiative and the No to NATO, No to War Network. He has long been active in justice and peace movements, beginning with the civil rights and Vietnam era peace movements. He helped launch the nuclear weapons freeze campaign and was co-convener of the 2010 NPT Review International Planning Committee. His books include Empire in the and the Bomb, How the U.S. U Uses Nuclear Weapons to Dominate the World, and The Sun Never Sets, Confronting the Network of U.S. Foreign mil Military Bases. So welcome, Joseph. First of all, just to uh, say that it's you know, sort of an honor to be uh, following both uh, Jackie and Ramana, and in some ways my, my remarks will, will build on that. Thinking as we start, I was thinking of both of dreams and nightmares. Uh, listening to Ramana's speech, I was thinking of uh, Kurosawa's, one of his last movies, uh, Dreams. And you get to the last dream, which is this vision of an idyllic, non-consumer world. And I just would encourage people to, to track that down, to give yourself a sense of, of, of what's possible. Uh, on the subject of nightmares, I want to show you this uh, first uh, picture here. Um, 
I, I first saw it in a seminar at Harvard University. Uh, and what it has, as you can see, are Chinese and Japanese warships and Taiwanese uh, fishing vessels. Now, if you can tell which is which, you're doing better than me. Uh, and there you have know, been a number of incidents, and in that session, uh, Ezra Vogel, who was in charge of uh, 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 intelligence uh, for Asia uh, at the State Department in the first Clinton administration, uh, said, you know, if, if we have an incident there, we can have no confidence, he said, uh, that escalation can be capped. What he means is that you begin with Japanese and Chinese military actions. Uh, then with the United States, both Obama and Congress, having said that the U.S. Uh, alliance with Japan means that if there are, if there are military actions, military to war, uh, the United States has to come in on Japan's side. Uh, then put yourself into what happens when the United States and China are at war and how that can be contained to a non-nuclear crisis. So this is the picture that has haunted me uh, for quite some time. And simply to say this is a not one-off event. And this is what it's like there uh, very, very frequently. And I want to encourage people who are thinking about human survival uh, to begin to think about what's happening there. Additionally, and I don't have the, the map on this one right now, uh, think in terms of the South China Sea, uh, which is much larger, uh, where it has uh, under, under the seabed uh, not only classical minerals need for manufacture, uh, but also uh, lots of oil uh, and natural gas. Uh, the Chinese have claimed at this point almost all of the South China Sea, uh, with, enough, with six other states of the ASEAN uh, countries also having claims to portions of it. Chinese have said this is a vital interest, and Hillary Clinton said, well, in fact, it's a vital interest for the United States, too. And this is the area where you have a very, very sharp arms race, and is yet another a very dangerous uh, tinderbox uh, for future conflicts. Uh, I guess I would also just underline uh, that uh, Susan Rice, formerly the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, now the National Security Advisor, uh, was just in China to prepare for Obama's forthcoming visit. Uh, and if you read the press, what, what uh, it says is the United States and Chinese relations are now at the lowest ebb in many years. This should concern us. Uh, the situation, actually, I'm going to focus on Asia Pacific, but I'll come back around to Ukraine uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but to say that, as I view it, the situation in Asia Pacific uh, has many, many analogies uh, to the situation in 1913-1914 in the run-up to the First World War. On the one hand, most fundamentally, you have rising and declining powers, the United States and China. Uh, remember, Obama made reference to Russia as a regional power, uh, not, not a major global power. No. Uh, you have arms races with new technologies. You're thinking in terms of the Pentagon budget. Much of it is focused on the process of trying to contain China militarily. Uh, you have resurgent nationalism. In China, nationalism is really the dominant <coughs> ideology at this point, replaced uh, you know, communism. Uh, in Japan, you have an extreme right-wing prime minister, uh, and Japanese nationalism is very powerful. Uh, one only needs to pick up a, a newspaper here in the United States uh, to think about how insane uh, our nationalism is as well. Territorial disputes. Uh, I've just pointed to a few. You have others as well. Uh, and I want to point to the, the, the role of those territorial disputes in relationship to resource wars. And when we're talking oil and gas, uh, we're talking in terms of fossil fuels, we're talking about uh, CO, CO2, we're talking about climate change. So the very direct uh, relationship there. Uh, and you know, basically resource competition. Uh, Michael Clare, who will be speaking at the rally tomorrow, and he's speaking at, uh, elsewhere here, gave a really fine talk, uh, it was the last week, uh, at MIT. And he pointed out that on the one hand, uh, where, as we have resource competition, competition for these climate change gases, we are increasing the dangers of war. And on the other hand, as we have uh, uh, increased military tensions, uh, we reduce the ability to move forward in climate change negotiations. Uh, you have to think in terms of the United States and China at this point making a fundamental deal. Uh, it's rather unlikely. And the third point uh, it was to stress the, the, the reality that no one country can uh, really resolve or reverse climate change, uh, that it has to be a global effort. 
But then you have complex alliance structures. Uh, again, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Japan alliance is fundamental, uh, but you know, Philippines is a major uh, uh, NATO partner at this point. Uh, we have alliance, we have military and military relations with uh, Indo with uh, Indonesia. Uh, we now have military to military relations with Vietnam, with our uh, 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 Ships now calling Cameron Bay. Uh, very delicate negotiations with India. The United States attempts to surround and isolate you know, China. I think in terms of what prevailed in, the, in, in 1914, as those interlocking alliances went into function uh, following a gunshot in, in Sarajevo. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, you have economic competition and integration. Back in 1914, it was thought that a, a war in Europe was impossible because of deep in, in, integration. Uh, British and, and German trade, uh, but it happened nonetheless. And finally, you have wild card actors. Both the United States and Russia engaged in uh, nuclear missile exercises. Uh, to appreciate, uh, Jackie made reference to Eric Schlosser's book in terms of the history of um, miscalculations and accidents. And this is the kind of time when accidents can happen. Um, you know, you go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, and you literally had uh, senior U.S. military officers uh, who were increasing the level of the nuclear alert in ways that the uh, Soviets could see and we could not. A very dangerous kind of situation, and there's a history of, of, of accidents there. Uh, we're going to have to deal with that. Uh, as we look at the Ukraine crisis, we should uh, understand that, uh, contrary to what we read in, in, in the dominant media here, uh, the United States and the European Union played fundamental roles in bringing that on. Uh, to remember that when the Berlin Wall fell, um, uh, the terms of, of agreement were that Germany could uh, reunite along West German terms in exchange for uh, the, uh, the pledge from the West that we would not expand NATO one centimeter closer to, uh, to Moscow. Uh, to remember that from a, a Russian perspective, uh, they're, as they look West, uh, they're thinking in terms of Napoleon's invasion, uh, Kaiser in World War I, Hitler in World War II, cost of tens and tens of millions of, uh, of Russian people. Uh, and so while we don't praise what uh, Putin has done in response, uh, we need to understand uh, the fundamental fear that the Russians feel as NATO has expanded, you can see in, in, this, in this slide. Additionally, the European Union uh, bears considerable responsibility in the negotiations on trade. Uh, you had uh, the EU proposal, which was zero sum. Uh, 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 Ukraine had to uh, commit to full and open trade relations with the West while cutting those with Russia. Uh, and this is extremely difficult, you can understand, in a country where major portions of the country had major trade relations uh, with the East, uh, which has uh, been long divided between those looking toward Russia, those looking to the West, and the religious divisions uh, between Russian Orthodox, those who follow Russian Orthodox faith uh, and those who uh, are Catholic and more Western oriented. Uh, so then turning here, um, I, I want to break some of the abstractions. You know, you, uh, someone was like, saying yesterday at a meeting, you know, that uh, you know, we're approaching the 70th anniversary of the a bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We should celebrate that there hasn't been the use of nuclear weapons uh, for the last 70 years, uh, despite the fact that Eric Schlosser and many others have studied the history of nuclear weapons accidents, miscalculations, uh, would say that it's, uh, our survival is less a function of wisdom and more function of accidental luck. Uh, the reality is uh, that the United States has used, and other nuclear powers to a lesser extent, have used their nuclear weapons time and again uh, since 1945. Daniel Ellsberg, who was a senior advisor to uh, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, to Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and initially Nixon, uh, explained that the United States has used uh, those weapons uh, during uh, international crises and, uh, and wars in the same way that an armed robber uses a gun in the middle of, of a robbery. When he points the gun at your head, whether or not he pulls the trigger, the weapon has been used. Uh, as early as 19, we have the whole idea of deterrence, right? 1946, the Soviet Union did not have nuclear weapons, uh, yet Truman threatened to eliminate Moscow. Uh, if the Russians did not withdraw from the portions of uh, northern Iran uh, that uh, had occupied with U.S. agreement uh, during the Second World War, principally to supply Russia uh, with weapons. Uh, this is a history of the U.S. use in, uh, in Asia Pacific. Uh, There's only a small portion of it. As you look here, 
uh, numerous threats against North Korea uh, beginning in 1950 uh, helps to explain why North Korea uh, has become a nuclear power. Uh, five times against China uh, beginning in the 1950s. Uh, four times uh, against Vietnam. Uh, it's a consistent pattern. Uh, then if you look to, um, to the Middle East, again, it begins in 1946. Uh, during every major Middle East war, uh, the United States has prepared and threatened to initiate uh, nuclear war weapons, the nuclear war. I have the, you know, the, 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 de the details and the history are in the book uh, Empire uh, and the Bomb. Uh, let me just point to a couple other things. I mean, we tend to think, well, with the end of the Cold War, uh, there goes the danger. But let me give you a, a post-Cold War history of their uh, use. Uh, 1996, uh, Clinton threatened their use against Libya at a time when uh, Gaddafi was our enemy. Uh, 1998, uh, against Iraq. Uh, stepping back uh, again to 1996, there was an exchange of threats between the United States and China uh, over, over Taiwan. Uh, the Chinese sent a message that it's just coming before a major election in uh, Taiwan. Uh, the Chinese sent a message that uh, uh, the United States certainly valued Los Angeles more than did Taiwan. Uh, and then Clinton responded uh, by sending two uh, nuclear-capable uh, U.S. aircraft carriers through uh, the Taiwan Straits. Absolutely terrorized the Chinese. They had no defense against it, uh, which in turn led to much of their, their subsequent buildup. Uh, you know, we've had now since the Bush administration all options on the table in relationship to Iran. When a nuclear power says all options on the table, that's what it means. Uh, you have know, threats against Korea, uh, we had the India-Pakistan uh, cargo war, uh, during which India and Pakistan exchanged nuclear threats. And to appreciate, the recent studies tell us uh, that the exchange of simply 50 to 100 uh, strategic weapons would result in global cooling, uh, the resulting famine uh, calling, uh, leading to uh, 2 billion deaths. Uh, so there's a deep integration here. And finally, Chirac of France uh, made a nuclear threat against uh, uh, the Iran. Um, there's a lot more to say. Here's, here's on the nuclear weapons accidents and history. Um, so just to move to conclude here, um, Jackie made reference to, to the Hibakusha, the politi politically engaged Hibakusha in Japan, who have provided major leadership for the nuclear weapons abolition movement. The man on the left, Shinji, Shinji Yamaguchi, is holding up a picture of himself. He had 20 operations. Uh, one of the founders of the movement, uh, incredibly courageous and, and forceful human being. This is him talking at the special session on disarmament uh, at the United Nations in, um, in, in 1982. Uh, and uh, one of the basic messages of the Hibakusha is that human weapon, you know, human, human beings and nuclear weapons do not exist. Uh, on your right is, a, uh, my right is Joseph Rotblatt. Uh, he was the one senior scientist with the moral vision uh, to quit the Manhattan Project. Went on to found the Pugwash Conference. And I first met him in, in Hiroshima, uh, where, again, he said that uh, human, fa human species faces a very stark choice. We can either completely eliminate nuclear weapons, or we'll see their global proliferation and eventual use. Why? Because no nation will long tolerate what it perceives to be uh, an unjust uh, hierarchy of power, or in this case, terror. In this regard, I'd like to uh, celebrate uh, 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 Tony de Bruyne in the Marshall Islands, uh, where a, when you look at the hierarchy of power and threat, uh, the Marshall Islands has, has found a way to respond with amazing uh, moral courage and, and vision. Uh, uh, and just to conclude, uh, Sophia made reference to the Nuclear uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference, which will happen uh, next year. Uh, it's been a frustrating process, but people should appreciate that terms and conditions of one of the most fundamental treaties of the 20th century uh, was that in exchange for the non-nuclear nations remaining non-nuclear, uh, the nuclear powers in Article 6 commit to good faith negotiations to completely eliminate their arsenals. Uh, and so a number of us are in the process. In 2010, we had a major conference and demonstration here in New York. The Japanese presented uh, uh, 7 billion petition signatures for abolition. Uh, Ban Ki-moon spoke at our conference. Uh, so we're in the process of, of organizing again and to appreciate that it has 
uh, our, our work has three principles. Uh, one is to demand the complete elimination of uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, second is to move the money to uh, cut military spending to meet essential human needs. Uh, and thirdly, to engage with the climate change movement. These are all deeply interrelated realities, and we need your support and help as we try to uh, make the change we need for human survival. Thank you. I'm welcoming up Andrew Lichterman, uh, who is a policy analyst and lawyer with the Oakland-based Western States Legal Foundation. Um, as a lawyer, he has represented peace and environmental activists in a variety of settings, and also taught in, uh, at alternative law schools for many years. In recent years, his work has focused on the purposes and impacts of U.S. nuclear and other strategic weapons programs, including their effect on global disarmament affairs and on, their relationship on the relationship between nuclear technologies, militarism, and the global economy. He is a member of the Global Council of the Abolition 2000 Global Network to Eliminate Nuclear Weapons and serves on the Coordinating Committee of United for Peace and Justice. And there is a lot more to say about Andy, but unlike our uh, other panelists, he stuck to the request to provide a uh, light bio. Um, Andy, please add anything else that you would like to about yourself, um, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Well, I guess what I'll add is that I, I started out my, my independent, on the verge of adulthood, political life with an underground newspaper in a high school in <laughs> upstate New York, where I could uh, look out my window and see the water tower of the nuclear weapons facility in the Knowles Atomic Power Lab. And one of the people who I met through this underground paper is here today. <laughs> so, you know, listening to the other speakers, uh, what I really realized my talk is about is why do we end up with technologies that are expensive and dangerous like nuclear power? And why is conversion of the centralized power structures, both military and civilian, so hard? And on the occasions when people talk about uh, climate change and nuclear weapons at the same time, the focus is almost always just on the effects. Burning immense quantities of fossil fuels and nuclear warfare, as many have said, are the two ways that the human species can do enough damage to the ecosystems we all depend on to not only threaten our own species, but the rest of life on Earth. But at the same time, the threats that are posed by global warming and nuclear weapons also have common causes. Each is a predictable product of an economy that's been dependent on endless material growth powered by rapidly expanding energy supplies, driven for centuries by ruthless competition among authoritarian organizations of ever-increasing size. The roots of the nuclear dilemma run deep. Our technology has been shaped by the central role war-making has played from the early days of Western modernity. No, no less important has been the race to control and extract the most easily available forms of concentrated energy, fossil fuels. As the historian Charles Tilley wrote, this has been true from the beginning of the development of the kind of nation states that have come to dominate the planet. He said, power holders' pursuit of war involved them willy-nilly in the extraction of resources for war making from the populations over which they had control and in the promotion of capital accumulation by those who could help them borrow and buy. War making, extraction, and capital accumulation interacted to shape European state making. This connection between the capacity to make wars and the extraction of resources, particularly fossil fuels, remains strong. The US military is the largest institutional consumer of oil in the world, using over 100 million barrels per year. Much of it in operations aimed at assuring the continued flow of oil to global markets. As Tilly put it, war makes states. And war making has played a leading role in the kinds of science and technology that the victors have chosen, the kinds of science and technology that have survived and prospered up to now. The world wars of the 20th century constituted leaps forward in technology and social organization in the most powerful states. The world was profoundly changed by World War II and the permanent state of war engendered by the interaction of the political changes it wrought and the technologies and institutions it spawned. The bomb is only the leading instance 
of the direction and magnitude of technological change and the military-industrial complex only an example of the power and social character of the kind of organizations that have come to dominate the modern world. These organizations extract a privileged wealth stream for their upper echelon inhabitants from the rest of an increasingly globalized economy using particular technologies, uh, rather combinations of technology, ideology, and organizational technique. And in, in each instance of these large complex of organizations, they operate together in very specific ways. Today, nuclear power and high technology weapons are elements in and also help to sustain a global circulation of trade and investment devoted to the production of goods and services that only a fraction of the world's population can afford to buy. Large organizations, whether public or private, provide services and buy and sell mainly to each other or to consumers who are the upper echelon inhabitants of those same organizations. The technocrats, bureaucrats, managers, and professionals who constitute what we know as the modern middle class. This dynamic pushes much of the world's population towards the margin with luxury crops, resource extraction, and now biofuels driving hundreds of millions of people off the land and into burgeoning urban slums all over the world. Yet at the same time, development efforts continue to center on centralized energy and transportation infrastructure designed to serve global supply chains for upmarket consumer goods with urban areas worldwide competing to become stable nodes in this increasingly insular top tier of the global economy. <clears throat> now, in this kind of world, Weapons and military services are going to be a growth industry. High-tech weapons and nuclear technologies provide a very effective strategy for sectors of national elites and of the professional and managerial classes to carve out secure places for themselves in this increasingly stratified economy. They provide privileged access to their own country's resources, capital largely without competition in capital markets, and a development context that can be shielded quite effectively from foreign competition. <clears throat> the tools of nationalism and fear of foreign others, easily amped up with sophisticated propaganda techniques, facilitate the extraction of wealth from the rest of society around them. National security secrecy prevents scrutiny of nuclear enterprises that whether in first-generation nuclear powers like the United States or post-colonial states have been rife with technical problems, corruption, and widespread intractable environmental impacts. In this context, it's important to note the connection between nuclear weapons and nuclear power is a feature, not a bug. Nuclear technology, with its vision of near-magical, Limitless power, an image its purveyors always have very energetically promoted, casts as well a positive aura over big, centralized, high-tech development programs that are profitable for elites, but have little or, no, or even negative value for much of the population in this, in this ever more stratified world. <coughs> now, we need to keep this broader background in mind when we're thinking about forming strategies. So again, when people start trying to figure out, when we're bringing our movements together, you know, where do we start? One of the first places people start with um, the military issues, nuclear weapons, high-tech weapons, and so forth, and climate change, try to for forge cooperation among the different parts of our movement, is with conversion, working to convert military facilities for green jobs, the military industrial complex to green jobs. And let's consider this against the, the background of this, this starkly stratified global economy I've sketched out. Perhaps the most consequential fact for the fate of in, an individual in today's world is whether or not you have a secure place in an organization in this top tier of the global economy. And for large organizations, the minimum requisite for a secure place in that upper tier is a strategy that allows them to minimize competition to the degree of extracting a rent-like return from the rest of society. This now is acknowledged even in the economic mainstream. Uh, Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz writes that 
We have a political system that gives inordinate power to those at the top. And they have used that power not only to limit the extent of redistribution, but also to shape the rules of the game in their favor and to extract from the public what can only be called large gifts. Economists have a name for these activities. They call them rent-seeking. <laughs> the reigning standard for what constitutes a good investment has become the capacity to extract these kinds of returns. Organizations that have developed strategies which enable them to do this are unlikely to abandon them easily. High-tech armaments industries, including nuclear establishments, are a case in point. Now, there are also practical difficulties in converting many kinds of military research and manufacturing. A little congested here, sorry about that. <coughs> military research and, uh, yeah, you sit there for now. So the practicalities of conversion have actually been fairly well documented and, and could require a separate discussion. But the most important obstacle, I think, is that the organizations of the military, industrial, and nuclear complexes have these economic strategies that are dependent on particular combinations of technology and ideology and organizational technique. Again, the use of national security fear, secrecy, connections directly to the state, and so forth, that are not easily redirected to other pursuits. They're going to be very reluctant to abandon them and the favorable position they've carved out for themselves in order to compete with other powerful sets of organizations. The arms makers don't want to be competing for capital and customers with wind turbine or solar or rail manufacturers in China or even lower cost emerging manufacturing centers around the world. And it's important to note that this is so not only for investors and top managers in military and nuclear industries, but for professional and managerial workers and skilled production workers who have fairly secure positions as well. Workers in the arms industries, and particularly in aerospace, make significantly more than average American workers. One recent study showed that um, aerospace workers make about $80,000 a year on average, compared to about a $44,000 uh, average median wage. So those holding secure positions in military industrial complexes are unlikely to see alternatives that provide them with a, com a comparably privileged path forward. Their strategies and their economic power provide them with a very effective means for defending their place in the status quo, particularly in a society like the United States where money converts pretty seamlessly into political power. So it shouldn't surprise us that organized workers in top tier enclaves like the military industrial complex side with their employers on matters of of economic development policy and also technology choice. So here's uh, language from an international association of machinists and aerospace workers leaflet. The IAM has and continues to urge Congress to increase funding for several programs that benefit Lockheed Martin directly and indirectly in the annual defense appropriations bill. <laughs> Over the years, we have successfully lobbied jointly with Lockheed Martin's legislative representatives to add or restore funding levels for the F-16, F-22, F-35, C-130, and the C-5. Now, how am I doing for time? Three minutes? Uh. <laughs> All right, I'll skip. Are these papers going to be available? Yes. So uh, another thing we really have to keep in mind is that many of our, con our conversion strategies of the past have implicitly been dependent on a world in which governments, many of them including this government, pursued Keynesian economic policies, where there was a significant po uh, possibility of aiding this conversion process with significant funding from the state. All the signs are there that the Keynesian era is over. This is something that many commentators have been writing about recently. 
And so um, I could say a lot more about that, but I just want to sort of skip to the end, which is here again, I think what we have to be doing is we don't abandon the conversion discussion because it's hurt hard. But once again, what we do is we focus on causes rather than effects. So, you know, we're not likely to move things much further along by asking high-tech workers whether they wouldn't rather be making solar panels or wind turbines or something, something like that. Chances are that most of them would. The place, I think, to start the conversation is by asking, why is it you can't choose work that contributes to a more peaceful and ecologically sustainable world without risking your family's economic future? And I think we have to realize that in times of great disparity of wealth and power, the middle positions, the possibilities for incremental gains through normal politics for those in the bottom and middle ranges of society tend to disappear. Um, at the same time, and this is relevant to Ramana's comment that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, the depth and interdependence of these crises we face provides an opportunity for a new and deeper conversation about the kind of social change we need. And I'm going to close with a little uh, remark about this from the labor scholar and activist Sam Gindin, who observed, the polarization of options under neoliberalism provides potentially fer fertile organizing ground. More radical ideas now have the potential to take on a relevance that is not just ideological, as the moderate is exposed as being impractical. What does become practical is the radical.